Hello, Maria. Thanks for coming in for the interview. It's my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Well, as you know, the company has been expanding and we have an opening in our HR department. We're creating a new role for someone to lead our training and development within the company. Yes. I very much think that my skills and experience are a good fit for what you're looking for. That sounds great. Uh, so, your CV looks strong, though it would be good if you could give us an overview in your own words of what you've been doing over the past four years or so. Well, in my first job four years ago, I was working for a small HR services provider which offered HR services including L&D to corporate clients. Okay, so it was only B2B? Yes, we only offered services to other companies, not B2C. Right. And it says here you then left that company about three years ago. Yes, that's right. I was looking for a little more stability and also to be part of a larger organization. So I joined a company with around 100 staff and a small HR team. As there are only a few of us, we each deal with a range of HR topics. In addition to payroll, one of the areas I was responsible for was learning and development. I see. And so why do you want to change jobs now? Well, I very much like the L&D side of my role, and I've always had particularly good feedback for my work in this area. I believe I excel in that field. So I'm looking to specialize, and as your company has around 2,000 people, right? Yes, that's right. Well, an organization of this size would give me the scope to specialize in L&D. I'm also a big follower of your brand and feel fully aligned with your image and values. Well, that all sounds good. And I can see you have an L&D qualification. Yes, I got a diploma two years ago. I am also currently working on a further diploma in psychology with a specific focus on learning and performance management. Very good. Well, it looks like you have the qualifications and experience we're looking for. What do you think will be the main challenges of coming to a much larger company? I can see that it might be perceived as a weakness to not have experience in an organization of this size. Though I see that it could also be a benefit. I won't be bringing too many preconceived and possibly inflexible ideas with me to the world. Yes, that would be a good thing. Also, I'm used to taking a very personal approach to employee development. I realize that such an approach with 2,000 staff members will have to happen in a different way, but I bring many ideas with me that can be replicated on a larger scale. I see what you mean. Right, so, do you have any questions for me? Um, I think we've covered many of the areas I had wanted to address. I have two quick questions, though. Go on. Who would I mostly work with on a daily basis? Well, there's the HR manager, who you would report to, and then the HR team, which currently has six people in it. There's usually an intern or two who you can get some support from also. Okay, thanks. That's all really clear. And my other question is, how performance in this role will be measured? What does success look like? That's a good question. As you know, we have a performance management system in place, and from that, we have identified some learning and development needs within the organization. But we haven't devised a strategy. Your role would be to devise and then successfully implement this strategy. Thank you. That sounds interesting. Great. So, uh, thanks again for coming in today. We'll be discussing all candidates next week, and then I'll get back to you by the end of next week to let you know the outcome. Thank you for your time. I'd welcome the opportunity to continue discussing this role with you. The big 4-0, Charles. Oh, it's your 40th. Are you planning a party? No, I never celebrate birthdays. I don't see why this one should be any different. Why not? Well, first, you know me, I can't be bothered with the hassle. It's my birthday, but I'm supposed to do all the hard work. Contacting people, finding a venue, organising food, worrying who will show up. No thanks. Ah, uh, someone's angling for a surprise party, eh, Dora? Marco, stop. Even worse, having to pretend to be delighted 50 people just sprang up in your living room when you thought you were coming home to put your feet up. Probably having a heart attack at the shock. Note to self, never to organise your surprise party. Okay, then. You've got to do something, though, Charles. It's your 40th. Why? 
What's so great about getting old? Uh, still being here to have your birthday? Yeah, aging is better than the alternative, as they say. Yeah, and it's true. So why not celebrate? You guys can have parties for your 40th if you like. I just don't go in for that kind of self-indulgent attention seeking. Wow, that's a bit harsh. I had a huge bash for my 30th, and you came and enjoyed yourself if I recall. Are you trying to say I was just doing it for attention? Not exactly, but well, at least a small part of you must have been. Remind me not to invite you to my 40th then, so you won't have to put up with my huge ego while I feed you and provide free drinks all night because I thought we were friends. I meant I mean not all attention seeking is bad. It's just not my style is all. Whereas it is mine? Anyway, I didn't say that. Uh, yes, yes you did. You said celebrating birthdays is self-indulgent and Guys, guys, who knew birthdays was such a touchy subject? Speaking of which, I have to sort out my 9-year-old's party the weekend after next. Now, that's a party I'd love to organize. Really? It's a nightmare. It's not like when we were kids. Now you have to take them all rock climbing or hire a makeup artist to come and teach them how to look like a zombie or a film star, and there'd be trouble if someone else in school had the same kind of party and your kid gets accused of copying. That fear you said about no one turning up, it's a million times worse when you're scared your kid is going to have no one turn up. Is there that much pressure? Yeah, it's crazy. Last year, I got it right with a cinema trip. Simple, but always a winner. But we can't do the same thing again, apparently. It says it in my official laws for 9-year-old's book. <laughs> <laughs> I've got so many fond memories of birthday parties as a kid. Party food and games and watching cartoons until your parents arrived. Trust me, your parents were stressing out. At the risk of restarting the argument, When do you think you stopped enjoying birthdays then? I don't know really. Somewhere around moving away from home and getting a job and being a grown-up. I don't mean birthdays are immature. I mean it takes a while to make new friends and so birthdays just become more low-key and it's drinks with a couple of friends or dinner or something. And I just got out of the habit, I guess. Maybe I just need to have a kid-style party like we used to have. Play musical chairs and eat pineapple and cheese on sticks and all that. Very retro. I bet people would love that. Yeah, they would. Well, I would anyway. And maybe it'll catch on with my kids and it'll start a new party trend. You've got me thinking. It's not a terrible idea. Maybe I will have a party this year. Jean, hi. Hi, Dave. How are you? Good, good. Wait a second. I'm not calling you in Canada, right? You're back now, aren't you? Yeah, I got back two days ago. Oh, good. Phew. Because I wouldn't want to be calling you long distance without realizing it, and suddenly you spent a fortune on a long distance call. No, I know it's okay. I actually wouldn't answer the phone while I was over there if I saw the call was coming from England. But no worries. We're in the same country now. Yeah. So, how was the trip? Did you meet your long-lost uncle? I did, actually. It was very good. I flew to Toronto and stayed there for a few days. At first, I was really worried about my accommodation because I kept reading these appalling stories about rental flats going all wrong. Oh, was it one of those? Yeah. My friend had a disastrous experience in Barcelona with one of them. The place didn't look anything like the photos, and all the neighbors hated that there was a holiday flat in their building. Awkward situation. Ugh. Right. So as I was saying, I was really worried because I heard these stories. And at first, I couldn't find the place. Turns out I was in the wrong building. It was next door and on the top floor, and wow, gee, this place was fabulous. Really spacious with these floor to ceiling windows and the most scenic views of the city. I could see the lake and the whole city skyline and skyscrapers from my bedroom. I had to pinch myself to prove I wasn't dreaming. Sounds pretty cool. So, what's it like? The city, I mean. I've always wanted to go to Canada. It's nice. 
I mean, it's another big, vibrant, modern city, but it's really clean, and there's lots of parks. One of the things I liked was the multiculturalism. We visited Chinatown, Little Italy, Greek Town, Little India. Um, well, I can't remember the others, but it was sort of a new area every three or four blocks, you know. Hey, is it true that there's a whole part of the city that's underground? I read that somewhere about Toronto, or saw it on some TV show. It's true. I asked about that. They call it the Path. There's like almost thirty kilometers of restaurants, shops, cinemas, and stuff, all underground, in the middle of the downtown area. Amazing. Yeah, but actually, once you're down there, it's not that noticeable. There's actually a lot of natural light. I forgot we were underground. It's mostly useful to get out of the cold weather. What temperature was it while you were there? It was still only November, but it was getting cold. We had at least a day where it was less than zero. My uncle told me that in January and February it can go down to twenty below zero. Oh wow! I think I'd die. Yeah, and the worst thing was what they call the wind chill factor. So they say the temperature is zero degrees, but minus eight with the wind chill. So it feels like minus eight. And my uncle said the wind chill factor can go down to minus forty. Stop it! You're making me feel cold just thinking about it. So, how was meeting your uncle, the famous Uncle George? That was great too. He lives outside of Toronto in a cottage by a lake. Really tranquil and unspoiled nature. I'm dying to see photos. You want to meet up soon, or are you too jet lagged still? Yeah, I'm actually free tomorrow if you like. A. I'll never forget the first time I met our new contact from Retrolink, one of our top five customers. I had travelled to their office to meet him in person, talk about the history of our companies together, and define a shared vision for future cooperation. I wanted to focus on building a good relationship with him, which would be a good foundation for working together. So when we met. I wanted to make a good impression and also show him respect. I greeted him with a handshake and addressed him by his surname. When I put my hand out, I realized he had been moving in to give me a hug, so we did an awkward mixture of the two. Also, when I greeted him by his surname, he responded politely, though he used my first name. It was all a little uncomfortable. In this situation, I guess I made assumptions about the level of formality he expected. Even though he had never met me before, he knew our two companies had been doing business with each other for years, and he wanted to build on that history by being less formal with me from the beginning. The real learning here for me was that I shouldn't assume we all have the same ideas about meeting people for the first time. B. I'd never worked with a virtual team on an international project before. It was quite exciting, though also challenging to work with people from different countries, many of whom I would never actually get to meet in person. There were a lot of things that were different about working in the same office, and it was quite challenging at the beginning. For example, there were different time zones, different IT systems. And even different local regulations, which impacted on what each person was allowed to or able to do for the project. There were also interpersonal differences, such as different ways of working, approaches to deadlines, and when to reply to emails. And we shouldn't forget the fact that English was the project language, and that most people on the team had to work in a language which wasn't their first. A positive of this was that it meant that everyone. Including the native English speakers, had to make the effort to communicate clearly and clarify their own and everyone else's understanding. To help us all get on the same page, we defined the communication norms and the rules the team would follow, as well as the meeting dates and deadlines. We lay this all out in a document called a team or project charter. This was really useful, and in the end, the project was a great success. I'm looking forward to working on my next international project. C. 
I went through a bit of a rough patch last year at work. I was already committed to too much, and then we lost a team member through restructuring, and I quickly became overloaded. This led to me doing too much overtime and feeling very stressed. My boss was really helpful, and she pushed back against the unrealistic targets that had been set for our department. She also introduced me to the SMART approach to goal setting. It's an acronym, S-M-A-R-T. You use it to create goals that are specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and timely. I used this approach to deal with all of the things that were overloading me. It helped me to prioritise some tasks, to do some later, and to drop some completely. I often use this approach now, and feel much more in control of my time and workload. D. Have you ever missed a flight or had one cancelled? I did. It happened to me last week. My flight home from a business trip was the last one of the day and we were told it was going to be delayed. That's always a risk at the end of each day. The ground crew kept extending the delay until eventually they cancelled the flight completely. They then told us to go back through the airport to the departures area to talk to their agent who would organise hotels for everyone and rebook us on the following day's flight. As soon as they made the announcement about the cancellation, I knew I had to think quickly, as it would not be likely that the flight would have capacity to take everyone from my cancelled flight. I hurried back through the airport and was one of the first to make it to the desk. That turned out to be a good idea, as there were only nine seats available on the flight the next morning. Everyone else had to fly to a different airport and then continue back to our destination airport in coaches. Lucky me, right? Jean, hi. Hi, Dave. How are you? Good, good. Wait a second. I'm not calling you in Canada, right? You're back now, aren't you? Yeah, I got back two days ago. Oh, good. Phew. Because I wouldn't want to be calling you long distance without realising it and suddenly... You spent a fortune on a long distance call. No, I know. It's OK. I actually wouldn't answer the phone while I was over there if I saw the call was coming from England. But no worries. We're in the same country now. Yeah. So, how was the trip? Did you meet your long-lost uncle? I did, actually. It was very good. I flew to Toronto and stayed there for a few days. At first, I was really worried about my accommodation because I kept reading these appalling stories about rental flats going all wrong. Oh, was it one of those? Yeah. My friend had a disastrous experience in Barcelona with one of them. The place didn't look anything like the photos, and all the neighbours hated that there was a holiday flat in their building. Awkward situation. Ugh. Right. So, as I was saying, I was really worried because I heard these stories. And at first, I couldn't find the place. Turns out I was in the wrong building. It was next door and on the top floor, and... Wow, Gene, this place was fabulous. Really spacious, with these floor-to-ceiling windows and the most scenic views of the city. I could see the lake and the whole city skyline and skyscrapers from my bedroom. I had to pinch myself to prove I wasn't dreaming. Sounds pretty cool. So, what's it like? The city, I mean. I've always wanted to go to Canada. It's nice. I mean, it's another big, vibrant, modern city, but it's really clean and there's lots of parks. One of the things I liked was the multiculturalism. We visited Chinatown, Little Italy, Greek Town, Little India. Um, well, I can't remember the others, but it was sort of a new area every three or four blocks, you know? Hey, is it true that there's a whole part of the city that's underground? I read that somewhere about Toronto, or saw it on some TV show. It's true. I asked about that. They call it The Path. There's like almost 30 kilometres of restaurants, shops, cinemas and stuff, all underground, in the middle of the downtown area. Amazing. Yeah, but actually, once you're down there, it's not that noticeable. There's actually a lot of natural light. I forgot we were underground. It's mostly useful to get out of the cold weather. What temperature was it while you were there? It was still only November, but it was getting cold. 
We had at least a day where it was less than zero. My uncle told me that in January and February, it can go down to 20 below zero. Oh, wow. I think I'd die. Yeah, and the worst thing was what they call the wind chill factor. So they say the temperature is zero degrees, but minus eight with the wind chill. So it feels like minus eight. And my uncle said the wind chill factor can go down to minus 40. Stop it. You're making me feel cold just thinking about it. So how was meeting your uncle, the famous Uncle George? That was great, too. He lives outside of Toronto in a cottage by a lake. Really tranquil and unspoiled nature. I'm dying to see photos. You want to meet up soon, or are you too jet-lagged still? Yeah, I'm actually free tomorrow if you like. A. I'll never forget the first time I met our new contact from Retrolink, one of our top five customers. I had travelled to their office to meet him in person, talk about the history of our companies together, and define a shared vision for future cooperation. I wanted to focus on building a good relationship with him, which would be a good foundation for working together. So, when we met, I wanted to make a good impression and also show him respect. I greeted him with a handshake and addressed him by his surname. When I put my hand out, I realised he had been moving in to give me a hug, so we did an awkward mixture of the two. Also, when I greeted him by his surname, he responded politely, though he used my first name. It was all a little uncomfortable. In this situation, I guess I made assumptions about the level of formality he expected. Even though he had never met me before, he knew our two companies had been doing business with each other for years, and he wanted to build on that history by being less formal with me from the beginning. The real learning here for me was that I shouldn't assume we all have the same ideas about meeting people for the first time. B. I'd never worked with a virtual team on an international project before. It was quite exciting, though also challenging to work with people from different countries, many of whom I would never actually get to meet in person. There were a lot of things that were different about working in the same office, and it was quite challenging at the beginning. For example, there were different time zones, different IT systems, and even different local regulations which impacted on what each person was allowed to or able to do for the project. There were also interpersonal differences, such as different ways of working, approaches to deadlines and when to reply to emails. And we shouldn't forget the fact that English was the project language and that most people on the team had to work in a language which wasn't their first. A positive of this was that it meant that everyone, including the native English speakers, had to make the effort to communicate clearly and clarify their own and everyone else's understanding. To help us all get on the same page, we defined the communication norms and the rules the team would follow, as well as the meeting dates and deadlines. We lay this all out in a document called a team, or project charter. This was really useful, and in the end, the project was a great success. I'm looking forward to working on my next international project. C. I went through a bit of a rough patch last year at work. I was already committed to too much, and then we lost a team member through restructuring, and I quickly became overloaded. This led to me doing too much overtime and feeling very stressed. My boss was really helpful, and she pushed back against the unrealistic targets that had been set for our department. She also introduced me to the smart approach to goal setting. It's an acronym. S-M-A-R-T. You use it to create goals that are specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and timely. I used this approach to deal with all of the things that were overloading me. It helped me to prioritise some tasks, to do some later, and to drop some completely. I often use this approach now, and feel much more in control of my time and workload. 
D. Have you ever missed a flight or had one cancelled? I did. It happened to me last week. My flight home from a business trip was the last one of the day, and we were told it was going to be delayed. That's always a risk at the end of each day. The ground crew kept extending the delay until eventually they cancelled the flight completely. They then told us to go back through the airport to the departures area to talk to their agent, who would organise hotels for everyone and rebook us on the following day's flight. As soon as they made the announcement about the cancellation, I knew I had to think quickly, as it would not be likely that the flight would have capacity to take everyone from my cancelled flight. I hurried back through the airport and was one of the first to make it to the desk. That turned out to be a good idea, as there were only nine seats available on the flight the next morning. Everyone else had to fly to a different airport and then continue back to our destination airport in coaches. Lucky me, right? I'd like to turn now to the object which is the main point of this talk, the helix. This is a fascinating mathematical object which touches many parts of our lives: movement, the natural world. The manufactured world and our genetic makeup are all connected to the shape of the helix. A helix is a type of three-dimensional curve that goes around a central cylindrical shape in the form of a spiral, like a corkscrew or a spiral staircase. The helix is a very popular shape in nature because it is very compact. In fact. Helices are sometimes referred to as nature's space saver. In architecture too, the helix shape of a spiral staircase is an attractive option in buildings where space is very restricted. The most renowned type of helix is probably the double helix of DNA, or deoxyribonucleic acid. DNA is made of two helices that curve around each other, a bit like a twisted letter. DNA contains the genetic information or code that determines the development and functioning of all known living things. The helix shape is a very efficient way to store a long molecule like DNA in the limited space of a cell. There are different types of helices. Helices can twist clockwise, right-handed, or anti-clockwise, left-handed. An interesting experiment is to hold a clockwise helix, such as a corkscrew, up to a mirror. The clockwise helix appears to become counterclockwise. We can perceive examples of helices in many areas of our world. Spiral staircases, cables, screws, and ropes can be right-handed. Or left-handed helices, a helix that goes around a cone is called a conical helix. Examples of conical helices are screws or the famous spiral ramp designed by the architect Frank Lloyd Wright in the Guggenheim Museum in New York. Helices are also prevalent in the natural world. The horns of certain animals, viruses, seashells, and the structure of plants. Flowers and leaves can all contain helices. The human umbilical cord is, in fact, a triple helix. With the discovery that the helix is the shape of the DNA molecule, it is not surprising that the helix is found in so many areas. It's one of the most natural shapes in nature. Let's turn our attention now to the mathematical description of the helix. You'll need a pen and paper for the next part of the talk, as I'm going to give you some variables to write down. Take your time to notice the different sections. Welcome to today's Business for You podcast. The focus of this podcast is to think about innovation and why it's important, and also to look at different types and stages of innovation. By the end of it, you will hopefully have a better grasp of the topic of innovation, and be able to better understand and drive innovation in both your working and personal lives. So, why is innovation important? Well, simply put, without innovation, it would be difficult to make progress. Organizations and societies would stagnate. 
innovation is what drives us forward. It's what forces us to compete in the business world. It's what leads to better products and services and solutions to new and existing problems. From a business point of view, it's also something which is necessary for survival. Four key types of innovation are incremental, disruptive, architectural, and radical. Incremental innovation involves innovating in increments or small stages, step by step. It focuses on existing markets and technologies and aims to make improvements and design changes to existing products and services. Disruptive innovation aims to bring new ideas like technology or processes to existing markets. In that sense, the innovations will disrupt the market and the companies currently serving that market. The first touchscreen smartphones disrupted the mobile phone industry because up to then mobile phones had buttons and keypads. Architectural innovation involves taking successful ideas from one market or industry and applying them to a new or different market. This often happens when people think of other unconventional uses of existing technology. A good example of this can be seen in vacuum company Dyson's entry into the hand dryer and hair dryer market. Their advanced airflow technology from their vacuum cleaners was applied in reverse to machines that blow out air. In the case of these examples, it's personal hair dryers and hand dryers in public toilets. And finally, we come to radical innovation. This is where a completely new idea is created for a market that doesn't exist yet. It's often what we think of when we think of innovation, and it often swallows up existing markets. For example, the birth and growth of digital and downloadable music has practically led to the death of music CDs and even DVDs. Similarly, Film and TV streaming services may lead to the demise of traditional TV within a few short years. Moving on from types of innovation, let's have a quick look at five key stages of innovation. The first stage is idea generation. This is where you think of the initial idea and develop it into a more detailed proposal or plan. The next stage is support. You need to check if you can get support for it for example from senior leaders or stakeholders in your company. If you're innovating in your personal life, then the support you might need could be from friends or family. Do they think it's a good idea, and do they think it would work? The third step is to experiment and test out the idea. This could mean creating a sample or a prototype of it, if it's a product. Or if it's a service, you could test out a basic version of it. The fourth step is evaluation. You need to assess how successful your experiments were and what chances of larger success your idea will have. And finally, you then need to actually implement your idea. That's the fifth stage. So, there you have it. We've looked at four key types of innovation. Incremental, disruptive, architectural and radical and also five stages of successful innovation. Firstly, idea generation, then get support. Next, experiment and test out the idea. The fourth stage is evaluation, and finally, implementation. If I asked you to describe a great leader, I'd be willing to bet certain traits come to mind. Someone charismatic, dynamic, inspiring, a confident public speaker. You're probably imagining a man too, but that's a bias we'll save for another talk. We tend to think of great leaders as people who naturally take to the stage, who draw other people to them by their sheer presence, who are extroverts. But history has also been transformed by people who don't fit these descriptions. People like Rosa Parks, Eleanor Roosevelt, and Gandhi. These people would have described themselves as shy, quietly spoken, as introverts. 
Of course, we're drawn to extroverts. They're usually charming and persuasive, fun to be around. They're not quietly in the corner somewhere reading a book where we might not notice them. Introverts are mostly happy to let the extroverts take the attention. They'd rather not be in the spotlight. They'd rather finish that book. If they become leaders, it's not because they want to be the center of attention. It's because they feel compelled to act. They lead. Not because they enjoy giving orders, but because circumstances have put them in a position to make change. If they're the boss, they allow space for the ideas of others to grow because they're not trying to make their mark. An introvert sounds like a pretty good boss, right? You won't need to worry about them stealing your ideas or talking over you in a meeting. Some of our great creators are introverts too. People like the writer J.K. Rowling, the great thinker Darwin, and the designer of the first Apple computer, Steve Wozniak. It turns out coming up with good ideas is easier when you're engaged in quiet, solo contemplation than when you're leading the cheerleading squad. Not that I'm saying there's anything wrong with cheerleaders. Extroverts are great. Some of my favourite people are extroverts. But why is the world so set up for extroverts and so hard for introverts? Why are we always encouraging our kids to speak up, join in, work as a team? Nowadays, most schools and most workplaces are set up with the extrovert in mind. Children no longer sit in rows in desks; they sit in groups of four or six doing group projects. Even subjects like maths and creative writing are taught with an emphasis on group collaboration, even though most writers sit alone in front of their computer or typewriter with nothing between them and the blank page. A kid who prefers to go off into the corner and work alone starts to look like a problem. What's wrong with Janie? Why isn't she joining in? Studies show teachers think extroverts make better students, even though introverts actually tend to get higher grades. We're telling our introverted kids something is wrong with them, that they need to be more sociable, more outgoing. We're giving them fewer opportunities for the quiet contemplation they need in order to produce the best work and be their best selves. And then, at work, we do the same. Most offices today are open plan. Everyone working and creating noise in one big room, attending team building workshops or group brainstorming sessions. The introverts' worst nightmares. The introverts at school are judged negatively by their teachers, and when they reach the workplace, they're passed over for promotion into leadership positions. But introverts typically take fewer risks and make more careful decisions. And don't we need those traits too? I'm not saying let's get rid of extroverts and grab all those talkative, sociable performers at primary school and send them off to the library for four hours a day of solitude until they learn to tone it down. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying we're doing something like the opposite of that to introverts, and we need to stop. We need to allow them space to be themselves, and then we'll end up getting the most out of our extroverts and our introverts. Let's teach all our kids how to work with others and how to work on their own. Let's create space in offices and at conferences for people to work on their own when they want to, and give them the opportunity to come together to share ideas. Let's give staff away days where they go off into the woods, walk up a mountain, or wherever to work on something alone, as well as the team-building day where everyone learns to dance salsa together. The future is complicated, with a lot of huge, complex problems to solve. Let's make sure we've got our best people working on those problems in the way that suits them best, and then we've got to make sure we listen to our extroverts and our introverts, and everyone who sits somewhere in between on the scale. We're going to need all of them. A. We saw the ad in the summer, in about July, I think, but we weren't really serious about moving then, so we didn't even go and see it. It wasn't until November when they re-advertised it that we got in touch with the agency and had a look. 
They'd put the price down since the summer, too, I suppose, because it had been empty so long, so that made it more affordable for us, which helped us make up our minds. It was perfect. A bigger garden for the kids and enough space for an office. In winter, it was lovely, very cozy, in fact, which is important to me, as I really feel the cold, whereas my husband will open a window when it's minus temperatures outside. Anyway, in July, when summer really started and we had that heat wave, we understood why no one had wanted to rent it over summer. It was boiling. All those lovely big windows that made the flat so light and open were like a greenhouse as soon as it got warmer. From about eight in the morning until seven in the evening, it was like living in a sauna. We couldn't stand being at home and weekends were especially bad. No air conditioning, of course. If only we'd gone to see it when it was first advertised in July, we'd never have moved in. B. I always rent apartments when I go on holiday rather than staying in hotels. Hotels are so impersonal, aren't they? This way, you get to feel like you really live in the place you're visiting. It's the first time I've done it the other way around, though, and rented out my place. But it seemed like a good way of making some extra money. The website is really easy to use, and they only charge 5% commission, which is lower than a lot of the other holiday rental sites. It's all about the photos and the reviews. Get the photos right and the place can look really upmarket and spacious, but you don't want to make it look too much better than it really is or you end up with a bad review. It's better to undersell and over-deliver so guests are pleasantly surprised and leave an extra positive review. So far, I'm averaging three stars because of one bad review that brought my average down from four and a half stars but hopefully I'll get it back up during the busy season. C. Buying a house seems so far out of my reach is almost impossible, as it is for loads of people my age these days. My parents always told me renting was throwing money away, but it was different in their day. Then people could afford to buy a house on a normal salary, but nowadays house prices are so high and no bank will look at you unless you've got a huge deposit. The problem with my dream of buying is that it's never going to come true, not unless my parents help me out. But I got two sisters and we're all in the same position. At least they've both got good jobs. Not good enough to buy a house, but at least they can afford to rent places of their own in nice areas. I just don't earn enough to rent around here. Even if I get promoted to manager, it'll be tough to find somewhere unless I share and call me fussy. But there aren't that many people I want to share a bathroom and kitchen with. Some days I think I'll be stuck living with my parents forever. Even renting is like a dream to me. D. At first our landlord was really helpful. Couldn't do enough for us. You hear stories of nightmare landlords, and we felt like we were really lucky. Or so we thought, anyway. He redecorated the whole place, from top to bottom, and let us keep all the bills in his name, so we didn't have the bother of contacting all the companies ourselves. He even offered to come round and do the gardening, as he knew we both worked long hours and might not have time. That's where the problem started, now I look back. Then he'd pop round just to check everything's okay for you. Once a month, then twice a month. Soon he was coming every week with some excuse or other. In the beginning we'd invite him in for tea, but it was only encouraging him. So when we realised, we'd try to have the conversation on the doorstep instead. It got so bad we pretended to be on our way out if we saw him coming up the path. We'd grab our coats and walk round the block until he'd gone. I don't know if he was just lonely or just didn't trust us not to ruin his precious house. In the end, we gave our notice and found somewhere else. It's a shame because we really loved that house, but at least it's more peaceful in the new place. The sound of kids hanging out together. Or at least how it sounded a few years ago. Nowadays, a group of 
Well, just about anyone. Kids, teens, tweens, their parents might sound a lot more like this. Most of us spend hours a day with our heads bent over our smartphones. Research suggests teenagers spend as many as nine hours a day, while preteens spend up to six. I don't know. It's like the first thing I do in the morning, check in and see who's posted anything overnight. It's my alarm clock, so I kind of have to look at it. And then, you know, it's pretty hard not to scroll through. And it's not just teenagers and millennials. Generation X and even the baby boomers are almost as bad. I'm online most of the day for work, and you'd think I'd be sick of screens by the time I get home. But most of my news comes through Facebook, and I'm really into food, so I'll hold my hands up to being one of those people who post photos of their meals. But are we addicted to our phones and apps? And does it matter? Former Google and Facebook employees certainly think so, so they've set up a non-profit organisation, the Centre for Humane Technology, to reverse the digital attention crisis and promote safe technology for children. Anyone who's in queues round the block for the latest iPhone has to wonder what these people are thinking. You've literally got people sleeping in the street to get the newest device. Probably not even talking to anyone else in the queue because they're on social media, taking selfies in the queue to post to Instagram. If that's not addiction, it's certainly obsession. A more formal definition of addiction describes it as a repeated involvement with an activity, despite the harm it causes. Someone with an addiction has cravings. That feeling that you haven't checked your phone for two minutes and can't relax until you get your hands on it again. They may have a lack of self-control and not realize their behavior is causing problems, like texting while cycling or falling off a cliff taking a selfie. And in case you're wondering, I read about both of those via the news app on my phone, which updates every couple of minutes with the latest stories. Definitely addicted. So the Truth About Tech campaign by Common Sense Media and the Center for Humane Technology couldn't come fast enough for most of us. But it's children who are probably most at risk because of the effect tech addiction might be having on their brain development. Professor Mary Michaels of the Atlanta Future Tech Institute has been working with very young children. Mary, thanks for dropping by. What is your research telling us? Well, we know that screen time is affecting key aspects of healthy child development, like sleep, healthy eating, and what psychologists call serve and return moments, which are when parents respond to babies seeking assurance and connection by making eye contact, smiling, or talking. All perfectly normal things we do, and which help lay the foundations of babies' brains. It's much harder to engage with a baby normally if you're looking at your phone, or even worse, if parents give a crying child a phone to distract them instead of talking to them or hugging them, and that might lead to them failing to develop their ability to regulate their own emotions. And what about older children? Again, we know that teenagers who spend a lot of time on social media are 56% more likely to report being unhappy. And 27% more likely to suffer depression. Teenagers are especially vulnerable because they're more sensitive to highs and lows anyway. So we are looking at potentially higher instances of suicide, schizophrenia, anxiety, and addiction in teens, which is exacerbated by dependence on technology. It sounds like a vicious circle. They're more likely to get addicted to smartphones and social media. And that addiction itself makes them candidates for other addictions. Yes, that's right. Time to stage an intervention. Is there anything we can do to make tech less addictive? Setting devices to grayscale, which is basically black and white, might make them less appealing. Scrolling through a news feed of boring, washed-out photos just doesn't create the same rush as bright colors, perhaps. 
and you can turn off the notifications that are constantly pulling you back in to check your phone. So, is it a... Earlier on in today's lecture, I mentioned the importance of hand gestures and said that I'd touch on some of these. Pardon the pun. <laughs> hand gestures are, of course, often culturally bound and can vary from group to group. But there are a few of them which, if not universal, are very common indeed around the world. I'd like to focus on the history of four gestures in particular. The salute, the thumbs up, the high five and the handshake. The salute, a gesture most associated with the military, may have originated in the 18th century. The Grenadier Guards, one of the oldest regiments of the British Army, used helmets in the form of cones. These were held in place by chin straps. It was difficult to raise your helmet when greeting someone, so the soldiers simply touched their head with one short movement of the hand before quickly putting it back down again at their side. The thumbs up gesture apparently goes back a lot further. It's widely believed that this gesture goes back to Roman times, when gladiators fought in front of the emperor and eager crowds in the Colosseum. The fallen gladiator's fate was decided by the audience. If they felt he had fought well, they showed their approval with a thumbs up gesture. The emperor would then confirm this and thereby would spare the gladiator's life. If the crowd gave a thumbs down, on the other hand, that meant execution. However, there are no reliable historical references to thumbs going either up or down in the Colosseum. It may be that if the crowd wanted to spare the gladiator's life, then they would actually cover up their thumb and keep it hidden. They would only extend their hand and thumb if they wanted the gladiator killed. This actually makes more sense, as the emperor could much more easily see what the crowd was indicating when looking out over a huge arena. The high five hand gesture is almost universally used as a greeting or celebration. Many see its origins in baseball. Two US teams lay claim to inventing the high five. The Los Angeles Dodgers in 1977 or the Louisville Cardinals in 1978. It's quite likely that it was neither and the gesture might have a much earlier origin again. It is very similar to a 1920s jazz age gesture known as the low five or giving skin. This gesture involved people slapping each other's lower hands also in celebration. There are, in fact, numerous references to the low five in films of the era. Perhaps the high five is just an evolution of that gesture. The final gesture I'm going to mention today is the handshake. It dates back as a greeting at least as far as ancient Greece. In the Acropolis Museum in Athens, the base of one of the columns shows goddess Hera shaking hands with Athena, the goddess of wisdom and courage. It's thought that shaking hands rather than bowing or curtsying showed both parties as equals. In 17th century marriage portraits in Europe, we find many examples of handshakes between husband and wife. Now, of course, the handshake has a multitude of uses. Meeting, greeting, parting, offering congratulations, expressing gratitude, or completing an agreement. In sports or other competitive activities, it is also done as a sign of good sportsmanship. In this way, the gesture has not strayed from its original meaning to convey trust, respect, and equality.